This is that person who's free from all illusion. That person who's fixed in spiritual consciousness. That person who's not disturbed by whatever the world presents. That person is situated in yoga. Now when Arjuna is hearing all this, Arjuna at the back of his mind is thinking, if this person is so transcendently situated, would such a person fight a war? And this person is completely free from illusion, completely situated in spiritual consciousness. So would such a person fight a war? And to get an answer to that question, he asks, what are the characteristics of such a person? That is, the verse starts in 2.54. So do we recite verses or how do we know? Oh, okay. So 2.54, so he says, What is the language of such a person? Samadhi is the sikesha, one who is situated in that elevated spiritual consciousness of Samadhi. How do Kim Prabhashita? How does such a person speak? Kim Asita? How does such a person sit? And Vrajeta came. How does the person walk? How does the person move about? Now, the Bhagavad Gita is a Gita. Gita means it's poetry. And there's a fundamental difference between prose and poetry. It's not just that words rhyme at the end of a, a line of poetry. The mode of communication in prose is direct. <coughs> You speak in sentences. The mode of communication in poetry is often indirect. Poetry is considered beautiful when there are uh, there are metaphors, there are figures of speech, there are literary ornaments, and that's what enhances the beauty of the poetry. So here, if you consider this question literally, how does the person sit? How does the person walk? What is the language of such a person? This. No, it may not seem immediately relevant. Especially, how does the person sit or how does the person walk? Clearly, Arjuna is not asking about you know, some fashion model, how does the person walk on a ramp? You know, so what is going on over here? So here, our Acharya will explain, Baldevi Dhamma is saying that bhasha, it's a pragyastika bhasha. Bhasha, at one, means, at one level, means language. But he also says, if you go in Sanskrit, Bhasha means bhashyate iti bhasha. We use language to describe. So he says, what is it that we describe? We describe the characteristics of things. When you say somebody has gone somewhere and the person comes back, how is the experience? Now then we use language to describe, but what do they describe? The characteristics. Okay, the trip was boring, the trip was enjoyable, the trip was adventurous, whatever. So he says, Siddha Pradhisika Bhasha. Here, Bhasha refers not so much to language as to what is described by language. That is characteristics. So, what are the characteristics, the symptoms of the person? And then further he says, How does the person speak? Now, speak is not just, he's not asking about the fluency of speech. He's not that this person has a, this accent or that accent. What he's asking is, Normally our speech re represents how we respond to the world's ups and downs. That means sometimes, you know, some bad things happen and some people start grumbling and ranting and uh, crying. So we respond to the world's ups and downs by our speech. So it's how, when we ask him how do we speak, that means how do we respond verbally to life's ups and downs. And Kim Asita, how does the person sit? Kim Rajita, how does the person walk? This means that sitting is basically representing inactivity or focused, uh, not just passive inactivity, because when you're sleeping, we are also motionless, we are inactive, but we are not doing anything. Or when you're sitting, we are physically inactive, but still we are doing something. So sitting represents the state of focused sense control. Focused sense control. When I sit, okay, for example, right now I'm sitting, and I'm speaking, you are hearing. So what will happen is, 
So our senses in that sense are not very active, but it is focus. So how does one sit means how does one control one's senses? And then Vraja, the king, how does he want to move about? That means now life is not just about being inactive, but it requires us to be active also. So with control senses, how does a person act in the world? That is what he's asking. And these four questions which come in 54th verse, they are answered from 55 to 72. So now <coughs> the analysis of uh, this division is given differently by different acharyas. But broadly speaking, the first verse, 55, is an answer to the first question. What is the characteristic of the verse? 56 and 57, the two verses are answering the next question, what is the language of such a person? 58 to 63 is answering how does such a person sit? And then 64 to 72 is answering how does such a person walk? That means how does the person engage oneself? And broadly speaking, if you look at uh, people, now we look at them from different perspectives. If a doctor looks at a person, doctor may look, okay, this person's uh, nails are this color, maybe he's got anemia. This person looks overweight, or this person looks underweight, or whatever. We all look at people from our own perspectives. So from a spiritual perspective, what we look for is how much is a person spiritually connected. And that is the context in the discussion going on over here. So here, when Arjuna asked, uh, Krishna started to answer this question. So the first thing he says is in 2.55, Rajahava Tiyada Kaman Sarvan Parthama Logata Atmanye Vatmana Tushya Sita Pradya Sada Uchate So he says, the defining characteristic of a spiritually advanced person is a person rejects external pleasures concocted by the mind. The mind says, come on, eat this, watch this, touch this, enjoy this. And it, the, the Bhagavad Gita is precise. It is not saying that it rejects all external activities. Rather, the external drive for pleasure concocted by the mind, that is what is rejected. Then we all need pleasure. So where does this person get pleasure? Atmanya eva atmana by understanding one's spiritual identity, by relishing one's spirituality, the person gets happiness. Shri Prabhupada explains that what is the difference between a materialist and a spiritualist? He says, materialism, materialist is one who seeks pleasure externally, and spiritualist is one who seeks pleasure internally. So, Krishna is saying the characteristic of a self realized person here is Atmanya Eva Atmana Krishna. It is the person seeks happiness within. And then in the next two verses it describes, even when a person is seeking happiness within, even if a person is spiritual, they have to face life's ups and downs. So how do they face life's ups and downs? That it is a Rukheshwanadi Namana Sukheshu Vigatas Pruha Vitaraga Bhaya Krodha Stitadhemam Yuchite so, so dukkheshwa anudhi namana. So, a person, even when distress comes, the person doesn't get dejected. And when joy comes, the person doesn't become elated. Sukheshu vigatas pruha, vitara gabhaya krodha. Be emotionally uninvolved in material things. A person who is situated like this, sitadhir munirichyate. Such a person is spiritually evolved. A person is situated in a high spiritual consciousness. Now, how does this work out? Is this simply being uh, living like a stone, feeling no emotions? And when good things happen, you don't feel any joy, and bad things happen, don't feel any sorrow. Is it that to be spiritually advanced, you have to just become unemotional? Uh, like become like a unfeeling, like a stone? No. Krishna is acknowledging that there are some, sometimes good things happen. Sometimes pleasurable things happen, sometimes unpleasant things happen. And he's not denying the reality. He's saying that dukkha will come, sukha will come. But one doesn't get buffeted by it. One doesn't go up and down with it. So an example to illustrate this. Let's say um, a person has come to know that 
they had some grandfather or someone who passed away, that person has kept a big inheritance for them. Say five million dollars they're going to get. And now they're here and they have to go here to their ancestral house and there they're going to get it. Now while they're going along the way, so they see along the way there's a five dollar note lying on the ground. And they look at it, and as they try to go toward it, the wind comes and starts moving the note away. They give him one step forward, one more step forward. Now, if that person has no money, and a five dollar note will seem like a big thing, they keep chasing it. That person thinks, actually there's five million dollars waiting for me. So then, five dollars doesn't matter so much. So whether one gains five dollars, or if on the other side, Somebody, some thief comes and steals them from their pocket. And they have a $5 note over them if the person takes it. And they will not run after the thief. I will get there. I have to catch this thief. I will get the money. And especially if they understand that, you know, if they are going to get their inheritance, it's time bound. You have to reach that house in a particular time. If they reach it, then they'll get the inheritance. Otherwise, they'll lose it. Then, the value of what are they going to get and the time sensitivity in getting it. What happens is because of that, the five dollar loss or the five dollar gain doesn't matter so much. It's it is a loss and it is a gain, but it doesn't matter in the light of what they are looking for or what they are going to get. So similarly, a spiritually evolved person understands that at the spiritual level of consciousness, there is unlimited happiness awaiting us. And and they are on the progressive spiritual path towards that happiness that is much, much more than $5 million. And whatever pleasures we may get at the material level, they are like $5 gains. Whatever pains we may get, they are like $5 losses. So for those who don't have $5 million, the $5 is a big thing. But for those who rise their fix on the $5 million, the five dollars don't matter so much. And that's how the spiritually advanced person, the spiritually focused person, doesn't get shaken so much. Yes, there is distress, there is joy. But the person doesn't get agitated. Either way. Because their vision is fixed on something much higher. Vita Raga Bhaya Krodha. So Raga Bhaya and Krodha, Raga is attachment. Bhaya is fear. And Krodha is anger. These three are the primary modes in which we deal with things in the world. Say, you know, it may be we want to develop a relationship with someone. We get attached to that person. We are always thinking about that person. When will I meet, meet that person? What will we do together? How will our relationship go? That's attachment. And sometimes, you know, if we get scarred in some relationship, and we get angry with that person, Krodha. How could that person do like this? How dare? You know, Obsessed with that person. Crow the, crow the, crow the. Anger is there. And then somehow if we get rid of that relationship, get that person out of our life, but still when there is, even when we want to form some other relationship, there is my, there is fear. What if I am burnt again? What if I am betrayed again? What if I am hurt again? So basically at the material level, we go through these three emotions. We are attached, we are ever angry, or we are fearful. In all these three cases, we are still in material consciousness. So, we the Raghavaya Krodha. All these three phases of material consciousness, the spiritual seeker avoids, the spiritual uh, advanced person avoids, and in this way, stays fixed in spiritual consciousness. So, this is internal. And next was, uh, as I said, 56 and 57, these two verses are answering the question, how does a person speak? So before describing how a person speaks, Krishna answers, how does a person experience internally? And then in the next verse he says, how does a person respond externally through words? Yaha sarvatrana visneha stattat prapya shubha shubha na vinandati na dveshi tasya pragya pratishthita so first he said that a person doesn't become happy on getting good or does not get uh, unhappy on getting bad. Now in this verse, Krishna does not. Krishna says that he does not praise when he gets good, 
and he does not criticize when he gets back. And Prabhupada explains in the purport over there that the material world means there's always going to be some disturbance. And interestingly, Prabhupada says over there that some disturbances are bad and some disturbances are good. <laughs> but they are both disturbances. So he says that a devotee does not get disturbed. So a devotee does not praise too much, does not criticize too much. Now why is that? That because the devotee is purposeful, there's a higher purpose in life. You know, if we come into a room and we are searching for something specific, we just look, look where it is and go there, pick it up and come out. We just come into the room without much purpose and we look, oh, this room is decorated so nicely. Or we say, this room is so dirty, so disorderly. So when we don't have a purpose, then we get too caught in praising or criticizing. But if we have a purpose, then everything is centered around that purpose. And the higher purpose of spiritual growth helps a devotee to not take material situations too seriously. Either in terms of uh, getting delighted and praising them, or getting, reject, getting, deject, uh, getting dejected and criticizing them. So Vishwati Prathapur gives an example that he says that there were in the past mendicant saints who would go from house to house and beg for alms. So he says such a mendicant might sometimes be given very good food by someone and somebody might just give no food or some very uh, spoiled kind of food. So the mendicant on getting good food doesn't praise and say, oh, may there be lots of huge blessings to you. And on getting bad food doesn't say, you will be cursed. Is equal point. So after describing this, now Krishna starts answering the third question. The third question is, am I going too fast or something? I was just wondering if you want to take any more questions at all. Or okay. Yeah, I, I'm okay. However you would like, because I don't know how you take the classes. Would you, would you like to comment or ask any questions or whatever? Yeah, please. I just like this. <laughs> Thank you so much, Prabhu. Um, that story of you know, elucidating this idea of uh, how how it how it is that uh, the devotee is not disturbed by loss or gain, happiness and distress because uh, of that higher goal, and then how you reiterated because this point Prabhupada makes in the purports about frustration or, or um, it, it's for want of an ultimate goal. Um, so I'm wondering how, because we were just at a music festival and we were hearing a lot of crazy things. And, um, but there's this conception amongst the New Agers about how, you know, whatever it is, that's what it is. And like this idea of um, confining yourself to a higher goal, uh, it's artificial. Um, how do you respond to someone that is thinking that, you know, if, if for instance, you say, okay, there, in spiritual life, you, there's a higher type of happiness. You're like, oh no, well, you're just not accepting the fact that you're not accepting the moment. You're not accepting that this happiness that you're receiving now or this something that you're receiving now. You're trying to escape that and like, try and go to a, some kind of, does that make sense? Okay. So in New Age spirituality, there is the idea that we should live in the present and experience the present. So if there is pleasure, if there is pain, we just accept that. But if you just think of something in the future, some happiness we will get, then are we trying to escape from the present reality? There are, there are two different things. There is living in the present and there is living for the present. We also live in the present. But we don't live for the present. Living in the present means we are aware of what is happening. So devotees are also conscious. We live in the present, but our goal is not just in the present. We live for something higher. We are living for Krishna. We are living for attaining Krishna. So being in the present and being purposeful are not necessarily contradictory. Because that purpose is achieved by how we live in the present. That means 
that if we say in the future we will become absorbed in Krishna, we will develop love for Krishna, and thereby we are going to experience great happiness. Uh, but how are we going to come to that level of absorbing us in the love for Krishna? That will depend on how we are living right now. So a devotee is aware of the present. And Prabhupada explains in the purport how a devotee sees the present joys in the present days. He says, the joys come, come, the devotee says, Krishna, you are so kind. You have put me in a comfortable situation so that I can serve you better. And when distresses come, a devotee thinks that, you know, okay, these distresses are there, just my own past karmic reactions are there. But Krishna has kindly minimized them. So, a devotee is aware of the present, but a devotee's awareness is not limited to the present. So, the, we see the present, and we see the present as the womb of the future. As the womb, womb the means by which the future is going to manifest. So as if somebody is only thinking about the future and using daydreaming about the future as a means to escape from the present, then that is undesirable. The characteristic of daydreaming is that one is not doing anything practical right now. One is only fantasizing. But that's not the process of bhakti. If we do have a glorious future which we are aspiring for, but we aspire for it by how we act in the present. So, yes, be here now, as they say uh, in New Age spiritual. That's fine. But, you know, be here now for what purpose? There's a purpose to life. And that purpose is that we want to, we want to experience Krishna's presence now and we want to experience Krishna's presence more and more in the future. So, so when I was talking about, say, the 5 rupee gain or loss and 5 crore gain eventually, the 5 rupee gain or loss is basically experiencing material phenomena in isolation. That means I just get some food, oh, it's so delicious. I get some food, eh, this tastes so bad. I'm just experiencing them in isolation. But a devotee may also experience that this food is so delicious. But the devotee thinks this is actually food offered to Krishna. This is Krishna's mercy manifesting. So we experience the present, but we don't just ex our experience is not just limited to the material phenomena that we're experiencing. Uh, we see those material phenomena in connection with Krishna. And therefore, because we see the connection with Krishna, the material phenomena itself does not matter that much. It's not that we are blind to it, it's not that we are denying it, but it's, it's that we don't allow that to dominate our consciousness. So, uh, in spiritual life, we give attention to the present, but we don't give monopoly on our attention to the present. Monopoly. Monopoly? How do you pronounce it in America? Monopoly. Monopoly, okay. We don't give monopoly on the monopoly on our attention to the present. We are aware of the present, but we understand that Krishna is the master of the present, the past, and the future. So Krishna is present in the present, and Krishna will be present in the future also. So by being conscious of Krishna, a devotee sees material ups and downs in context, without getting too elated or too dejected. Okay. Any other questions upon that? This not, a, not a question, just a reflection. I was appreciating your point about uh, when one is focused ahead, when, when one has a higher goal, you're saying, you know, if you're going someplace where there's so much profit to be made, then the, the losses and gains on the way are, are much less. I, mean, I was thinking about, from the context of a practitioner, how, how relevant this is that, you know, if I'm actually Krishna conscious, if I'm actually aware of what's there in my relationship with Krishna, then my tendency to find fault in the material aspects of my life, either within myself or the environment or other persons, will be much less because it's there. You're saying, you know, the, the comings and goings are there. Krishna's advising that they're there. But if you're actually invested forward, whereas I've kind of noticed a tendency that if I, if I don't have so much Krishna conscious, so much actual investment in that relationship, 
then by default I'm looking for a perfect situation now, which is not to be found materially. Mm -hmm. So therefore I'm much more critical. So this tendency to find fault, this tendency to kind of like get lost in that thing. I just, I think you brought that up for me, so I, thank you. Beautiful, yeah, thank you. Yeah, actually one of the characteristics of spiritual growth is that we, our fault-finding tendency decreases. Like in the 16th chapter, Krishna says, one of the characteristics of the godly is a paishunam. They are averse to fault finding. In the Bhagavatam also it is said that uh, everybody acts according to their nature. And therefore the wise person neither praises nor criticizes. Because yes, people are simply acting according to their nature. And it's all temporary. So it's like, I don't know how it is in America, but in India sometimes we go in crowded trains and the trains may not be very clean. The train may have a bus over there. Now, if in the train there is no fan, so it's very hot. Now, if I'm in the train, if I'm going to be there for half an hour, one hour, it's not that in that time, while I'm trying to catch the train, you know, I'll go and buy a fan, and I'll fix a fan over there. You know, I don't need to do that, because I know that I'll just for a short time over there. So many of the inconveniences that we face in life, we just understand that they're temporary, and they're the transitional. We are going somewhere else, which is a better place. Then we don't get so worked up about it. So yeah, it's generally, this is the, often being in the present is, uh, is romanticized in today's world. But you know, there is a problem. If we are too caught in the present, then sometimes the present may be really gloomy. Then at that time, it is only the understanding that this present is temporary that's what enables us to move forward. If a patient is in terrible pain, and then the patient just be in the present. Well, the present is miserable at that time. So what helps the patient to tolerate is, this, this present pain is temporary. I have to move forward. The patient understands that I'm being healed, I'm under treatment, I'm being healed, so I can tolerate. In fact, the Bhagavad Gita, what we discussed earlier, Tam Sitiksha Sobharata, tolerate. And tolerate because agam apa inonityas. That whatever is happening is temporary. So, so we, we, we have to live in the present in the sense that the present is what we pass through. But we don't have to live for the present. The patient is not living for the pain that they are experiencing right now. The patient is going through the pain. But the patient is living for the healthy state that is going to come in the future. And that healthy state is what enables the patient to not become too bogged down by the present pain. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Regarding tolerance, I just, you know, let, 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 at what point does one take action in the situation which they're in to adjust things? And at which point does one just tolerate as an opportunity to practice tolerance? Uh, okay. What I've seen from many of Prabhupada's purports is that difficult situations are simply an opportunity for us to practice tolerance. And that in those situations, we grow from those situations. So rather than trying to adjust the situation so it's better, we simply just tolerate it. I, I also seem to remember reading or hearing that um, when you're at a very advanced stage, the bugs will be eating your body you'll be thinking, oh, well, they're getting their food, so I, I'll just let them eat my body. So, I mean, at what point do we say, okay, this is an exercise, it's uncomfortable, this, you know, rat is chewing on yeah. my foot. Um, it's not, it's <laughs> probably not very healthy. It's probably not very healthy, but it'll, it's a good opportunity for me to learn tolerance. Okay. So is that the right mentality, or is it a sahaja? Okay. So, till what point do we tolerate? Is it that, say, uh, if worms are eating our body, then you still think that this is an opportunity to tolerate? See, the Bhag same Bhagavad Gita that talks about telling Arjuna to tolerate, Tam Sitikshas of Bharata, that same Bhagavad Gita is also spoken to get Arjuna to fight. The smatam uttishtha yavkusha ola basva, jitva shatran bhangshva rajyam samrittam. Therefore, arise and fight and attain victory. Defeat your enemies. So Krishna is not telling Arjuna, 
No, these Kauravas are so vicious. They have committed so many atrocities. Just tolerate it all. No. So, tolerance is a virtue. But tolerance is not the supreme virtue. The supreme virtue is dharma. Ultimately, dharma cultivates in bhakti. So, for the purpose of our practice of dharma, for the practice, purpose of doing our bhakti, while doing it, we need to tolerate. But if sometimes the circumstance prevents us from practicing bhakti itself, if the circumstance stops us from doing service itself, then tolerating that means that we are not doing our service. So tolerance is for the purpose of doing our service. Tolerance is basically to keep small things small so that we can focus on big things. But if tolerance means we don't do any big thing at all, then that is not tolerance, that is importance. And that is not what the Bhagavad Gita recommends. For example, at one level Bhakti Sansu Thakur said that if we go for doing some programs and nobody comes, he says, speak to the walls. Mm-hmm. He said that. And when Prabhupada was trying to share Krishna Bhakti in India, not many people were interested. And what did he do? He didn't keep speaking to the walls. He came to America. Mm. Isn't it? And he found serious people here. And then he took those serious people back to India. And people took him seriously also. So Prabhupada could have said, oh, nobody is taking me seriously. I've been speaking for 40 years. This is an opportunity for me to develop tolerance. <laughs> he did not see that. But his focus was doing service to Krishna. Now, while doing service to Krishna, while he was, say, in America, and sometimes when he was giving a class, people would just behave in all kinds of strange ways. Suddenly people would ask questions. Suddenly people would get some uh, drug-induced highs and they would start blabbering some things. Uh, but Prabhupada would tolerate that. When Prabhupada was staying with, with <coughs> Gopal and Sally Agarwal in, uh, in Butler, Pennsylvania, at that time you know, he was a pure Vaishnava, but his food was in the same fridge where there was meat. And, and they, uh, they recognized this is not proper, but they didn't have any other fridge. They said, Swamiji, we're sorry about this. Well, they don't think about it. It's all right. So Prabhupada tolerated so tolerance means basically that uh, we don't let small things distract us from the big thing of our service to Krishna. But if the big thing of our service to Krishna itself is stopped, then we have to make changes. So uh, broadly speaking, that whenever any difficult situation comes in our life, there are three options we have. One is, we change ourselves. Second is, we change the situation. Third is, we walk away from the situation. And we see the Pandavas did all these three at different times. First was, when when the Kauravas tried to poison the Pandavas. When the Kauravas, sorry, they tried to poison Bhima, or they tried to burn them alive through arson. The pand- uh, Yudhishthira told them, this is a family matter, don't bring it in public. So they didn't publish, they just tolerated it. But then eventually, when the Kauravas tried to dishonor Draupadi, tried to disrobe her, and then they showed no remorse, no desire for reconciliation, then the Pandavas acted to change the situation. They fought a war for that purpose. And eventually, when the Pandavas were ruling the kingdom, they were ruling and eventually they came to know that Krishna has departed from the world. Then they walked away from the situation. They also renounced the world. So now all three situations, you know, just changing ourselves, changing the situation and walking away from the situation. All three can be dharmic actions. It depends on what is the best way we can serve Krishna at that particular time. So, in some times, you know, it's just something which we are a little troubled by, we tolerate it. In some cases, there's something seriously wrong, we need to act to correct it. We can do that in a mood of service. And when you walk away also, walking away is different from running away. 
when we run away from a problem, we are still, our mind is still caught in that problem. You know, this is so troublesome. I just want to run away from this. But when we walk away, that means we understand that I have better things to do in my life. You know, and because I have better things to do in my life, therefore, I will not stay boggled in this. And I walk away from it. So tolerance is basically to ensure that we stay focused on our service to Krishna. And why being focused on our service to Krishna? When some incidental problems come up, we just tolerate them. Does that answer your question? Thank you. So then, um, if we're not sure, like, I don't know, sorry, it sounds like a silly example, but there's a rat chewing on your toe and you're eating prasadam. Um, so, in that situation, since you're not sure whether you should tolerate or not tolerate, you should just tolerate it? If you're not sure? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, if a rat is chewing with our food while we'll be at the awning prasadam, should we just tolerate it? See, the Chaitanya Charitamru describes the incident of leper Vasudev who had worms on his body and when the worms would be there and they would fall off he would pick them up and put them in his body he said they just then they are getting their food now often the Chaitanya Charitamra especially and the scriptures in general they describe certain principles through extreme examples now the extreme examples are not the standard. The extreme examples are meant to dramatically illustrate a principle. Hmm. Just like uh, in the pastime of Ajamil. Now he chanted the name of Narayan once. And he was nutti pashad amuchyata. He was saved from the jaws of death. Now what is the conclusion of the Bhagavatam from this? Does it say that all of us can also do all kinds of sinful activities and at the time of death we chant Narayan? That is not what the conclusion. That's an extreme example of the Lord's mercy and the Bhagavatam's conclusion over there, what Shukadeva Swami says, and then Prabhupada also says in his purport is that, that if Ajamil chanted once and that too unintentionally, and he was benefited so much, then if we chant lifelong and we chant with the intention of referring to calling Krishna, then if the Lord was benefit was merciful to Ajamil, then, then will he not be merciful to us? will surely be merciful. So therefore, we should... So the extraordinary example of mercy is not meant to be treated as a standard process for getting mercy. We have to follow the standard process. And the extraordinary examples are meant to reinforce our faith in the standard process. So similarly, there can be extreme examples of tolerance that are given. But they are not the standard. The standard is that we do whatever is required for our service to Krishna. So Prabhupada was quite particular that when he would, when the devotees were serving him, uh, if he would he would sleep in a mosquito net, especially in Mayapur and other places where mosquitoes were there. And you know, Prabhupada was particular that there should be no mosquitoes inside there. If they bit him, they would just distract him. And inside the mosquito net only he would be, uh, he would wake up early and then he would start doing his translations. Is commenting. So Harishwaripur writes one time that practically he had to, so many mosquitoes came inside, he had to get all the mosquitoes out, swap it and get it out. So Prabhupada, you know, he could have said that I can tolerate the mosquitoes. He would have tolerated. But the point was he had to do something more. You know, his goal was not just to tolerate. So for in our case, you know, we have to see that Shariram Dharma Sadhanam. The body is what we need for our service to Krishna. And for the service to Krishna, we have to take care of the body. So, tolerance is not meant to, uh, as I said, we made it a supreme virtue where we unnecessarily hurt ourselves. See, tolerance doesn't mean that others trample us and we just accept it. Tolerance simply means that we have our sense of perspective. That this is temporary, this is, this is, this is just temporary, that is much more enduring. So I will not let this temporary come in the way of the enduring. So now in this case, if a rat is biting, then I just flip the rat away and I move on. 
Because that is something which is temporary. I have to take care of my body. But suppose, say somebody has to go and preach in a particular place. And in that place, that place is just, there are foaming rats over there. And there's no other place to stay over there. So that's just unavoidable. That's the place where one has to stay, then one will stay over there. So it's not that uh, tolerance doesn't mean that we don't try to change anything at all. That way, if we start saying, you know, we can just go to any limits. Now, a small baby is crying, and the mother can say, mother will say, no, let the baby cry. The baby will learn to tolerate pain by that. No. You know, where will be all humanity? Where will be any love? Nothing will be left. Somebody, some devotee is sick, and he say, instead of helping that devotee, you know, he say, okay, the sickness is teaching you tolerance. So no need to go to any doctor, no need to take any medicine, just be sick. No. But our focus should never be on simply tolerance. Our focus has to be on dharma. So when a baby is crying, the mother should not be thinking whether the baby is learning tolerance or not. The mother is thinking, what is my dharma? If a devotee is sick, you know, we should not be thinking, I have to teach this devotee tolerance. Think in this situation, what is my dharma? My dharma is to do Vaishnava seva, to try to serve a devotee. So, but while doing our service, if some unavoidable difficulties come, then we tolerate those difficulties and we move on. Okay? Thank you. Any other questions or comments? There's a difference between being tolerant and being passive, right? Very much. Yeah. So is there a difference between being tolerant and being passive? Yes. As I said, tolerance is so that we can focus on doing our dharma. Passive means we are not doing anything at all. A tolerant devotee is, also, is first and foremost a devotee. Devotee means that devotee is focused on Krishna, that devotee is absorbed in Krishna. And we can look at, say, Parikshit Maharaj's example. When he was cursed by Shringi, at that time he was tolerant. He said, okay, it's, I've got this curse, I'll renounce the world. Now, but he was tolerant, but was he passive? No, he renounced the world, he went to the banks of the Jamuna, he sought out the sages, he understood what is the supreme principle of dharma, and he started practicing that. And that same Parikshit, while he was a king, he saw that Kali was performing atrocities against a cow and a bull, and at that time he needed to pick up his sword and ready to punish. So, in both cases, his purpose was, he wanted to follow dharma. So when he was actively acting as a king, then he was assertive to punish wrongdoers. And that was his dharma. But when he decided that he has been cursed, he didn't want to counter, then he decided, his tolerance was, that he did not try to counter, counter curse the Brahmin boy. He did not try to take vengeance against the family. He accepted it. But then even when he was tolerant, he was still very purposeful. He want, okay, now I have only seven days. How best can I use those seven days? So, passivity is uh, in the mode of ignorance. Tolerance is in the mode of goodness. Passivity comes because I just don't have the energy to do anything. I either don't have the energy to do anything, I don't have the intelligence to do anything. So, passivity is lethargy, it is apathy, it is... Uh, it is negativity. Whereas tolerance is that because I have something much more important to do, so therefore this small thing, which I will, I'll neglect it. So I hope that it's, the difference is clear. It's a very big difference. Externally it may appear the same, but internally the consciousness is very different. Okay. Thank you. Can, from that, can it be said that retaliation is in the mode of passion? So if, if passivity is in the mode of ignorance, tolerance is in the mode of goodness, is okay. like retaliation, mode of passion? Yeah, good question. 
So, is retaliation in the mode of passion? It can be, but not necessarily. If you see in the 18th chapter, Krishna talks about the qualities of the four varanas. So, in 18.42, he talks about the quality of a Brahmana. He says, Samodamastapaha shauncha shanti rarjava mevacha jnanam vijnanam astikyam brahma karma svabhavajam so there he talks about tolerance, forgiveness, peacefulness as the quality of a Brahmana. And in the next verse itself, 18.43, he talks about how Yudhe chapya palayanam tejas Shmaduti shaucham Yudhe chapya palayanam dhanam ishwar bhavascha Shatram karma svabhavajam So he says, what is the quality of a Kshatriya? He says, Yudhe chapya palayanam If there is a fight, the Kshatriya does not run away from the fight. It stays there strong and fights. So you see the almost opposite qualities. Non-violence, forgiveness, peacefulness is the quality of a Brahmana. And oh, fighting unflinchingly is the quality of a Kshatriya. So what does this mean? That different people have to perform different roles in society. So as per the role that we are meant to perform, as per the Dharma that we have to do, we may have to act in different ways at different times. So, uh, tolerance can be in the mode of goodness and retaliation can be in the mode of passion. But if one is actually taking assertive action, hmm, that, uh, that need not be in the mode of passion, that can also be in the mode of goodness. So, you know, when the Pandavas fought the Kurukshetra war, they were not fighting that simply to take retaliation against the Kauravas. They are not fighting only for revenge. If their goal was revenge, then they would never have proposed a peace pact before the war. And a peace pact on such accommodating terms that they said, just give us five villages. So the fact that they were ready for that means that they were simply interested in doing their dharma as Kshatriyas. So they fought not to get even, not to take revenge but to, uh, to establish the rule of dharma, to remove the dharmic people from the rule, from being the rulers, for they would make the whole society irreligious. So, when there is assertive action against someone, retaliation done just to get even with someone, that is in the mode of passion. But assertive action taken need not always be in the mode of passion. Assertive action may be taken for the purpose of establishing dharma. The Krishna himself says that he descends to Vinashaya Chidushkritam. He says he descends to destroy the demoniac. Why does he destroy? Because they are irredeemable. They are just not going to change. Then they have to be destroyed. So that is not at all. When Krishna is acting, obviously that is not in the mode of passion at all. So assertive action, if it is done for the establishing of dharma, then that is also in the mode of goodness. If it is done with the mood of pure service to Krishna, then it can even be transcendental. Thank you. So, let's move on. Yes, Mataji. Can you say something about forgiveness being affected by the modes of material nature? Forgiveness. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how is forgiveness related with the modes of material nature? Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is basically the means by which we don't let the past come in the way of the present. Past, in the past people have hurt us and uh, that hurt is still there. But we don't let the past come in the way of the present. So, broadly, when somebody has hurt us, there are three broad alternatives. One is that if that person who has hurt us, uh, they apologize, and that's just a one-off event. They just did something for under the spur of the moment or whatever. Then we forgive and we just move on at the end of the chapter. So, mm 
but this is in the mode of goodness where we recognize that life has to move on and i have to move on in my doing of dharma in my doing in my practice of bhakti so i'll just close the chapter now sometimes we may in the mode of passion basically we may just think that oh, i have to get even so in the mode of goodness we are ready to put the past behind and move on in the mode of passion you know we just keep a track of all the wrongs that they have done we are looking for opportunity when can i get back at this person so when we are doing that basically we are still letting that person dominate our life and uh, what are we doing we are just holding the negativity within us so that we can pour it out on that person sometime in future but even if we do it or we don't do it that negativity is going to hurt us more mm. so that is in the mode of passion where we want to get even so we are basically thinking oh, how can i get back at this person but in the mode of ignorance we simply feel powerless we simply feel helpless we get consumed by self pity we we conceive of ourselves as victims uh, there is this whole phenomenon of self martyrdom oh the world is so bad people are so bad they are all hurting me and uh, oh, i am so i am i am so miserable so one simply wallows in self pity so if in the, the hurts of life simply make us uh, passively lethargically just feel sorry for ourselves that is in the mode of ignorance but if the hurts of life make us want to vengefully get back at the other person that's in the mode of passion if the hurts of life we close that chapter and we move on in our life then that's in the mode of goodness now in the mode of goodness also we have to be cautious not every situation not every wrong doing is simply going to end by forgiveness as i said if it's a one off event person once did something wrong and they have apologized and they rectify themselves so and they move on but sometimes that person has done something wrong and they do it once they do it twice uh, what is that saying um forgive me one no no what is that no you know yeah you know fool me uh, if you fool me once shame on you if you fool me twice then shame on me it basically what it means is that if a person keeps continuously fooling us cheating us hurting us and if you keep letting them do that then we are simply being foolish you know so um um so then when that person is repeating that pattern then we have to differentiate between forgiving and trusting now forgiving is for the past trusting is for the future forgiveness can be given but trust has to be earned so okay this person did something wrong and i i'm not going to obsess on it if say somebody has stolen some money from us somebody gave somebody stolen some money from us and then you know it troubles us okay the person is sorry i did this we forgive them but then if after that we entrust our whole treasury to them and then they steal it away that's our stupidity so we may forgive them but we need not trust them we have to see how they conduct themselves we keep some safe distance and then let them show by their actions whether they are really repentant whether they are really reforming so we withhold trust and then if they act properly then gradually we give the trust so a so this is first is we forgive and just end the chapter move on in our life because it is a one off incident the other option is we forgive and then we observe with old trust and if that person really rectifies themselves then they can come back again to the level of forgi- of trusting the relationship can become normal but sometimes the person may just not even be uh, what is speak of being willing to rectify sometimes if people don't even know that they have done wrong they don't even acknowledge that they have done something wrong then at that time you know we just have to take some assertive action 
maybe cut off the relationship, or depending on the gravity of the crime, we may have to take some wrongdoing, we may have to take some assertive action, some as they say, restorative justice. And even in that, we can have forgiveness as an emotion. That means I am not going to hold the hurt against you. But you know, if if you are not corrected for this, then you will repeat this. You will hurt other people. You will hurt me, you will hurt other people, and ultimately, if you consider the law of karma, you're going to hurt yourself. So we may pursue legal or corrective action against that person, but we can do it without a vengeful attitude. We can do it for the purpose of dharma, for the purpose of protecting others, protecting the community, eventually protecting ourselves, and ultimately protecting that person. In the same Bhagavad Gita in the 11th chapter, where Krishna tells Arjuna, now arise and kill your enemies. Tasmatta muttisha yashola baswa. Jitva shatrun bhumshwarajyam samruddham. In 11.33 says, arise and conquer your enemies. The same chapter, 22 verses later, in 11.55 Krishna says, mat karma pkrun mat parmo mat bhakta sangha varjita nirvairaha sarva bhuteshu yaha samameti pandava. Krishna says, that act without animosity towards anyone. Nirvaira sarvabhuteshu. So Krishna is telling that those are enemies, kill them. But then the same Krishna is telling, act without animosity towards anyone. That means what? You are not killing them simply because they are your enemies. You are killing them because they are, they are destroying dharma. So do it as a duty. There is no personal vendetta against them. But rather, it is our duty to establish the rule of dharma and so we do it. So we can have forgiveness as an emotion even in the third case. That means we don't hold the resentment, we don't hold the grudge. We, okay, I forgive you for what wrong we have done, but there is a pattern over here. And unless some corrective action is done, then you keep repeating it. See, punishment has ultimately many purposes. One of the purposes of punishment is that the society should see that wrongdoers, they just cannot, they have a license to do wrong. So they have to be seen that wrongdoers are punished. Similarly, though society also has the important principle that uh, order has to be maintained. So I may not be, I may forgive at a personal level. Prabhupada writes in the second canto purport that non-violence can be, especially for Kshatriya rulers, it can be a strategic policy. But it is not necessarily a principle. Kshatriyas have to fight. So at an individual level, in one-to-one -one relationship, you may forgive. But if somebody is in an official position in a government, then they have to maintain the rule of law. And sometimes they may have to punish. So, so even that punishment can be in the mode of goodness if it is done for the service of dharma, rather than for a, with a vengeful attitude. Does that answer the question? So, we have a few minutes. Okay, any other questions or should I take up one more verses? Well, if you could just maybe bring us back to the, the, the flow of the, of the of where we are in the Bhagavad Gita. Okay, yeah. We so, so we are discussing about the characteristics of the enlightened person. I mean, the characteristics of the enlightened person, we saw how the what are the character, how does the person, what are the characteristics in terms of what are the symptoms and then how does person, such a person speak? And then from 2.50 to 2.63, Krishna will talk about how does a person, such a person sit? That means, how does such a person control the senses? So I'll just explain that principle briefly. And Krishna talks about, first, he says we need external regulation. He says, just as a tortoise withdraws its senses, one should withdraw uh, one's senses from the sense objects. But then he says, that alone is not enough. Even if you do that, the desires will come and they will overpower us. Therefore, he says, we need positive engagement. We need to fix the mind on Krishna. 2.61 is, Tani Sarvani Sanyamya. Yukta Asita Matvara. Fix the mind on me. So whenever we have to um, 
So we have some habit which we want to give up. We have some conditioning which we want to overcome. So there is, you have to work at three levels. The three levels are regulation, conviction, and purification. So regulation means at an external level. If say I'll give an example, it is alcoholic, and that person wants to, alcoholic wants to give up alcohol. Now, if that alcoholic's house is right next to a bar, then no matter how much that alcohol makes a resolution, I'll give up alcohol. Suddenly the desire may come up and they'll get caught. So they have to be serious. If their friends are all alcoholics, then they may have to change their friends to some extent at least. So without external regulation, no resolution can be maintained. We need some amount of external regulation. Now if I'm, if I'm thinking I want to diet and then I keep all kinds of fatty foods around me, readily accessible, it's going to be very, very difficult to diet. So, our willpower is a finite resource. Our willpower is not infinite. And the finite resource has to be used productively. If my willpower is constantly going, you know, okay, should I do this, should I not do this, should I do this, should I not do this? Then, my willpower gets, gets spent simply in in deliberating what I should not do or what I sh should I do this or should I not do it. But our willpower is meant for something much more constructive. It's like a student who wants to study and then the student is saying, okay, there is, you know, there is this a sports match going on, I want to watch that. Should I watch that? Should I not watch that? Should I watch that? Should I not watch that? Now the student may succeed in not watching it also. But then the mind has gone in that and no study has happened. So the point of the student is not just to not watch the cricket, not watch the sports match. The point of the student is to study. So regulation, the student decides, okay, the next, next uh, three hours I have to study, so I'll just block the internet. I'll focus on studies. So what happens by this? Then is that regulation minimizes the distraction. So Krishna says the first principle is regulation. So regulate the senses. Then the second principle he says is, buddhi is very important. The buddhi is lost, the intelligence is lost, everything is lost. So second is conviction. Conviction means, we ourselves need to be convinced, why I should not do this. So, sometimes we decide, you know, I'm going to give this up. But then the mind says, you know, actually, it's not that bad, you know. Doing a little is okay. And when we start thinking like that, then we are saying, and we just say, yeah, doing a little is not bad, you know, I just do a little. Then if I am myself not convinced about it, then when this temptation comes, a little you can do, then we get caught by it. That's why studying scripture and nourishing our intelligence is very important. Then, even when the mind starts tempting, even when the world starts tempting, so even if we have regulation, Regulation doesn't mean that no temptation will come. Even with regulation, temptation is going to come. And to reject that temptation, we need conviction. This is why I should not do this. And then beyond that is, third say is purification. So, purification means the desire itself goes away. The desire itself no longer troubles. And we can all experience that the process of bhakti does purify us. So, say, maybe most of us might have been eating meat before we started practicing bhakti. But after we start practicing bhakti for a few years, if we see somebody eating meat, hardly we feel tempted. Although we might have been eating it before. The desire itself has disappeared. So, so basically regulation means we don't let the objects stay close to us. Conviction means we are determined to say to no to the object even when that object allures us. Purification means the object no longer allures us. So the more we become connected with Krishna, the more we become absorbed in Krishna, we will come to the level of purification. Before we can come, we need regulation and conviction. So thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki.
कृष्ण प्रभु पाद की गौर भक्त बिंद की गौर प्रेमानंदे